about them. Hello. I've got another story for you today in my series of lockdown literature for shared reading. Today's is coming from this book, A Little Allowed for Children, which is published by the Reader Organisation. It is available as an e-book. You can get it online quite easily. If you have a copy, please feel free to read along with us. Today's story is by my favourite children's, one of my favourite children's authors, Michael Mulpergo. It's called The Silver Swan and starts with an extract from a work by Orlando Gibbons. The silver swan, who, living, had no note, when death approached, unlocked her silent throat. Leaning her breast against the reedy shore, thus sung her first and last, and sung no more. A swan came to my loch one day, a silver swan. I was fishing for trout in the moonlight. She came flying in above me, her wings singing in the air. She circled the loch twice and then landed silver, silver in the moonlight. I stood and watched her as she arranged her wings behind her and sailed out over the loch making it entirely her own. I stayed as late as I could, quite unable to leave her. I went down to the loch every day after that, but not to fish for trout, simply to watch my silver swan. In those early days, I took great care not to frighten her away, keeping myself still and hidden in the shadow of the alders. But even so, she knew I was there. I was sure of it. Within a week, I would find her cruising along the loch side, waiting for me when I arrived in the early mornings. I took to bringing some bread crusts with me. She would look sideways at them first, rather disdainfully. Then, after a while, she reached out her neck snatched them out of the water and made off with them in triumph. One day, I dared to dunk the bread crusts for her, dared to try to feed her by hand. She took all I offered her and came back for more. She was coming close enough now for me to be able to touch her neck. I would talk to her as I stroked her. She really listened, I know she did. I never saw the cob arrive. He was just there, swimming beside her one morning, out on the loch. You could see the love between them even then. The princess of the loch had found her prince. When they drank, they dipped their necks together as one. When they flew, their wings beat together as one. She knew I was there, I think still watching. But she did not come to see me again, nor to have her bread crusts. I tried to be more glad for her than sad for me, but it was hard. As winter tried and failed to turn to spring, they began to make a home on the small island, way out in the middle of the loch. I could watch them now only through my binoculars. I was there every day I could be, no matter what the weather. Things were happening. They were no longer busy just preening themselves or feeding or simply gliding out over the loch, taking their reflections with them. Between them, they were building a nest. A clumsy, messy excuse for a nest, it appeared to me set on a reedy knoll near the shore of their island. It took them several days to construct. Neither ever seemed quite satisfied with the other's work. A twig was too big, or too small, or perhaps just not in the right place. 
There were no arguments as such, as far as I could see. But my silver swan would rearrange things tactfully when her cob wasn't there. And he would do the same when she wasn't there. Then, one bright cold morning, with the ground beneath my feet, hard with a late and unexpected frost, I arrived to see my silver swan enthroned at last on her nest, her cob proudly patrolling the loch close by. I knew there were foxes about even then. I had heard their cries often enough echoing through the night. I had seen their footprints in the snow, but I had never seen one out and about until now. It was dusk. I was away on my way back home from the loch, coming up through the woods, when I spotted a family of five cubs, their mother sitting on guard nearby. Unseen and unsmelt, I crouched down where I was and watched. I could see at once that they were starving, some of them already too weak even to pester their mother for food. But I could see too that she had none to give. She was thin and rangy herself. I remember thinking then, that's one family of foxes that's not likely to make it. Not if the spring doesn't come soon, not if this winter goes on much longer. But the winter did go on that year, on and on. I thought a little more of the foxes. My mind was on other things, more important things. My silver swan and her cob shared the sitting duties and the guarding duties, never leaving the precious nest long enough for me even to catch sight of the eggs, let alone count them. But I could count the days, and I did. As the day approached, I made up my mind I would go down to the loch, no matter what, and stay there till it happened, however long that might take. But the great day dawned foggy. Out of my bedroom window I could barely see across the farmyard. I ran all the way down to the loch. From the loch side I could see nothing of the island, nothing of the loch. Only a few feet of limpid grey water lapping at the muddy shore. I could hear the muffled arking of a heron out in the fog and the distant piping of a moorhen. But I stayed to keep watch all that day, all the next. I was there in the morning two days later when the fog began at last to lift and the pale sun to come through. The island was there again. I turned my binoculars at once on the nest. It was deserted. They were gone. I scanned the loch, still mist-covered in places. Not a ripple. Nothing. Then, out of nothing, they appeared. My silver swan, her cob and four cygnets coming straight towards me. As they came towards the shore, they turned and sailed right past me. I swear she was showing them to me, parading them. They both swam with such easy power, the cygnets bobbing along in their wake. But I had counted wrong. There was another one hitching a ride amongst his mother's folded wings. A snug little swan, I thought, littler than the others, perhaps. A lucky little swan. That night the wind came in from the north and the loch froze over it. It stayed frozen. I wondered how they would manage. But I need not have worried. They swam about keeping a pool of water near the island clear of ice. They had enough to eat, enough to drink. 
they would be fine. And every day the signets were growing. It was clear now that one of them was indeed much smaller, much weaker, but he was keeping up, he was coping. All was well. Then, silently, as I slept one night, it snowed outside. It snowed on the farm, on the trees, on the frozen loch. I took bread crusts with me the next morning, just in case, and hurried down to the loch. As I came out of the woods, I saw the fox's paw prints in the snow. They were heading down towards the loch. I was running stumbling through the drifts, dreading all along what I might find. The fox was stalking around the nest. My silver swan was standing her ground over her young, neck lowered in attack, her wings beating the air frantically, furiously. I shouted, I screamed, but it was too late and too far away to help. Quick as a flash, the fox darted in, had her by the wing and was dragging her away. I ran out onto the ice. I felt it crack and give suddenly beneath me. I was knee deep in the lock then, still screaming, but the fox would not be put off. I could see the blood, red, bright red, on the snow. The five signets were scattering in their terror. My silver swan was still fighting, but she was losing and there was nothing I could do. I heard the sudden singing of wings above me. The cob, the cob flying in, diving to attack. The fox took one look upwards, released her victim and scampered off over the ice, chased all the way by the cob. For some moments I thought my silver swan was dead. She lay so still on the snow. But then she was on her feet and limping back to her island, one wing flapping feebly the other trailing, covered in blood and useless. She was gathering the signets about her. They were all there. She was enfolding them, loving them, when the cob came flying back to her, landing awkwardly on the ice. He stood over her all that day and would not leave her side. He knew she was dying. So by then did I. I had nothing but revenge and murder in my heart. Time and again, as I sat there at the lockside, I thought of taking my father's gun and going into the woods to hunt down the killer fox. But then I would think of her cubs and would know that she was only doing what a mother fox had to do. For days I kept my cold, sad vigil by the loch. The cob was sheltering the signets now, my silver swan sleeping nearby, her head tucked underneath her wing. She scarcely ever moved. I wasn't there, but I knew the precise moment she died. I knew it because she sang it. It's quite true what they say about swans singing only when they die. I was at home. I had been sent out to fetch logs for the fire before I went up to bed. The world about me was crisp and bright under the moon. The song was clearer and sweeter than any human voice, than any bird song. I had ever heard it before. So sang my silver swan and died. I expected to see her lying dead on the island the next morning, but she was not there. 
The cob was sitting still as a statue on his nest, his five signets around him. I went looking for her. I picked up the trail of feathers and blood at the lock side and followed where I knew it must lead, up through the woods. I approached silently. The fox cubs were frolicking fat and furry in the sunshine, their mother close by intent on her grooming. There was a terrible wreath of white feathers nearby and tell-tale feathers too on her snout. She was trying to shake them off. How I hated her! I ran at her. I picked up stones. I hurled them. I screamed at her. The foxes vanished into the undergrowth and left me alone in the woods. I picked up a silver feather and cried tears of such raw grief, such fierce anger. Spring came at long last the next day and, and melted the ice. The cob and his five signets were safe. After that, I came less and less to the loch. It wasn't quite the same without my silver swan. I went there only now and again just to see how he was doing, how they were all doing. At first, to my great relief, it seemed as if he was managing well enough on his own. Then one day I noticed that there were only four signets swimming alongside him, the four bigger ones. I don't know what happened to the smaller one. He just wasn't there. Not so lucky after all. The cob would sometimes bring his signets to the lock side to see me. I would feed him, feed it. I would feed them when he came, but then, after a while, he just stopped coming. The weeks passed and the months passed, and the signets grew and flew. The cob scarcely left his island now. He stayed on the very spot I had last seen my silver swan. He did not swim. He did not feed. He did not preen himself. Day by day it became clear that he was pining for her, dying for her. Now my vigil at the loch side was almost constant again. I had to be with him. I had to see him through. It was what my silver swan would have wanted, I thought. So I was there when it happened. A swan flew in from nowhere one day, down onto the glassy stillness of the loch. She landed right in front of him. He walked down into the loch, settled into the water and swam out to meet her. I watched them look each other over for a, just a few minutes. When they drank, they dipped their necks together as one. When they flew, their wings beat together as one. Five years on and they're still together. Five years on and I still have the feather from my silver swan. I take it with me wherever I go. I always will. Well, you might think, oh, another one of Andy's sad stories. But is it really? There's the pride in house building. Can't we all recognise that? The way the cob and the pen alter things to suit themselves when the other's back is turned. There's the way the cob defended the pen when she was being attacked by the fox. We see the care that the two animal mothers take of their young, the fox predating on the swan. We see the care the pen takes of her weakest signet. 
And what lessons did the human learn from this? Plenty to think about there. Now I'm going to read you the poem that goes with this story. It's by Edward Thomas and it's called Snow. In the gloom of whiteness, in the great silence of snow, a child was sighing and bitterly saying, Oh, they have killed a white bird up there on her nest. The down is fluttering from her breast. And still it fell through the dusky brightness on the child crying for the bird of the snow. A very short one. I think there the child imagines that the white snowflakes are the down from a dead bird. Do you think the child may have seen a white bird dead on its nest and that's why he continues to cry? Maybe it's the first time he's seen the snow. Let's have another little read of it. In the gloom of the whiteness, in the great silence of snow, a child was sighing and bitterly saying, Oh, they have killed a white bird up there on the nest. The down is fluttering from her breast. And still it fell through the dusky brightness on the child crying for the bird of the snow. There we are then. Bye for now. I'll see you soon with another story. Thank you.